Good morning. Good to be with you here again. It doesn't seem long since I was here last, but last Wednesday was the first time I'd been in your wonderful new building. And like I said there, I am struggling a bit with building envy, so please pray for me in that regard. I think you've got a wonderful facility here. My name is Dave, as Petra says. I'm the minister of Grace Church in Rendlesham, which is not far from here. And it's my privilege to be leading you through this time of Harvest Thanksgiving. Uh, and it seems sort of appropriate now, doesn't it? Yesterday, I was sitting in someone's garden in my shorts and it was 25 degrees. Last Sunday, we were sweltering. All of a sudden, it's changed. And now is the time to start looking back over the summer, looking back over the harvest. Just in case you've forgotten what harvest actually is, um, I know you live in the countryside, you're probably familiar with this, but I love these sorts of things on YouTube. And a guy who I came across put some videos together, and I want to show you now just a little reminder of what Harvest is all about. If we can have the video, please, Martin. This is what we are remembering in part when it comes to Harvest. There we've got a very old tractor out in the fields plowing. Big tractor. That sort of thing excites me. I love seeing, I love watching videos of this sort of thing. Apologies if you're bored, but this is how it all starts. Then you get a machine like this, another big tractor breaking the soil down, getting it ready to put seed into the soil, burying little bits of seed into the ground, throwing it away. Then it gets rolled down. I think this is rolling, isn't it? Yeah, making the field nice and flat, covering over the holes where the seed was put in and then it grows and you get one of these amazing machines going up and down the field, picking up this miraculous multiplication of corn that happens just in the ground all on its own. These machines are brilliant. They excite me, but actually the real magic, I shouldn't say magic, miracle of harvest is you put one tiny little bit of seed in the ground and then five or six months later, it grows into a plant with sometimes literally thousands of pieces of seed on it. That is the miracle that we are meeting together to praise God for today. Farmers plant the seed. We're going to thank God for them. People come and harvest the seed when it's grown and they do all sorts of other stuff so we can then eat and be fed by the stuff that's been grown. But it happens because God has made this wonderful world. So it makes perfect sense to thank God for the harvest. I've got a verse which you're going to be thinking about quite a lot this morning. It comes in the Bible. This is the verse, James chapter 1, verse 17, and it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. That's God, who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And that has found its way into the words of our first song, that verse. All good gifts around us. We couldn't start a Harvest Thanksgiving service without we plough the fields and scatter. So that's where we're going to start this morning. David has also chosen this one for tonight. Now, we did talk about it, and we did think, well, should one of us have it and the other one not? But we both wanted really bad. We thought about going outside for a fight, and we thought that wouldn't be a good idea. So instead, we thought, well, we can sing it twice, because it is harvest, isn't it? So let's stand and sing together. We plough the fields and scatter. <laughs>
And let's pray together now, asking for God's help as we meet to thank him and to celebrate his goodness. Our Father, the one who is the great creator God, who formed the sun, the moon, and the stars, and everything else. We pray that you would be with us here this morning as we reflect on what you have done for us and what you have provided for us. Fill us with thankfulness, we pray, for all your good gifts which you pour out on us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I wasn't really sure what to expect when I came here this morning. I was told that you don't bring food into the, ch the, the main worship space here. You leave it outside, but I haven't checked. Did anyone bring any food this morning? Or well, someone's brought some food. Excellent. A few people have brought food. That's good. I wasn't sure whether I'd see anything at the front. So I wasn't sure whether you would be able to remember some of the good things that God has given us that we thank him for today. Back in Rendlesham last year, we asked people to bring food along and we said, don't put it in a box. Don't bring it to the front straight away during the singing of the first song. Then you can bring it down and you can put it on the table. I'm not sure that was a very clever idea because it was chaos. We had all these kids struggling to the front with carrier bags as we were trying to sing. And they started putting this stuff on the table and they missed the table, some of them. There were tins running everywhere. A box of eggs got broken. The tables looked like they were going to break at the end. There was so much stuff on there. No one was singing. Everyone was just laughing at the children. So I think it's probably a wise idea not to be doing that this morning. But I do want us to remember some of those things that we had on our table last year and I'm sure is in the box outside. And I want to test you to see how good your memories are, okay? I'm going to put on the screen now some food. There it is, okay? Lots of exciting foods. Who can see any food on there? Who can shout out what the food is? Anyone know what the food is? Yes, what have you got? Corn flakes. Oh, corn flakes. I am now regretting not having breakfast this morning because it's made me feel very hungry. What have you got? Could you notice something else? What else was there? Raspberries. Yes, raspberries. Does anyone grow any raspberries in their garden this year? I grew about half a dozen, not plants, just raspberries, but they tasted lovely. Raspberries are wonderful. Anything else on there? Have a good look. Yes? Jaffa cakes, oh yes. Anyone got any Jaffa cakes in their cupboards at home? Anyone like Jaffa cakes? Oh, a few people like Jaffa cakes. Yes, what have you got there for me? Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I thought I loved every sort of Ben and Jerry's ice cream that there is until I tried the Bonoffi pie version. Didn't like that very much, but other than that, Ben and Jerry's is wonderful. Anything else on the screen that you particularly like that's making you feel hungry now? Have a good look. What do you reckon? Spaghetti, yes. And one of those very clever things that you can measure spaghetti with. I didn't know they were a thing. That would be so useful. Must get one of those because I always make far too much. But yes, spaghetti right there in the middle. There's lots of other stuff there is. Um, carrots. No one said carrots. Obviously not many people like carrots. No one said broccoli. No one likes broccoli. Potatoes, bread, porridge oats, baked beans, tomato soup. Lots of things, packet of crisps. Now, here's the thing. I want you to remember all those because they're going to disappear. And then I want to, you to tell me what's on the screen or what was on the screen. So you've got five more seconds to look. Four, have a quick look. Get them stuck in your mind. Three, two, one. Let's take the screen away. Right. What was on the screen? Okay, let's go around. One person can answer each time. So get in there quick. What do you reckon? Jaffa cakes. Jaffa cakes were definitely on the screen. Yes, young lady there. Broccoli, very good. And a carrot or a bunch of carrots. Yes, yes, okay. Two lads over here. Who's going first? Sorry? Beans, baked beans, yes. Bread, yes. So is that about five? Come on, who else can? Yes, go on. Ambrosia rice pudding. Ambrosia rice pudding, isn't that wonderful? Yes, okay, that's six. There's 20, yes? Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Tomatoes. 
favourites, are they? Oh, very good. Oh, there were some chilies on there as well. I did grow some chilies. They were quite hot, rather nice. Anyone else? Come on, we've got lots more. I've got them written down here, so that's all fine. Um, anything else? Yes? Crisps, a packet of crisps, yes. Crisps, as I didn't realise, were made in Norfolk. Did you know that? I'm sure you all did know that, living so close to Norfolk. I had no idea. And they're my favourite as well, so yes, yes. More? Spaghetti, very good. And anything else? There's one over here. Beetroot, was there beetroot on the screen? Rhubarb, yes, I was going to say. I was thinking, why didn't I put beetroot on there? Because I meant to, but that was rhubarb. Never mind, never mind. It looks a bit the same. Yes, at the back there? Eggs, yes, eggs. There were gooseberries on there, yes. I have, I've got a gooseberry bush in my garden. I had four gooseberries off that this year, so that was quite good for me. Yes, sorry? Porridge oats, yes, yes. Cucumber, yes. Were you going to say cucumber? You were going to say cucumber. Um, did anybody get the oh, apples? There were apples up there, I think you'll find. Um, and potatoes, definitely potatoes. Peppers, chili peppers, my favourite. There's one that hasn't been mentioned. Raspberries, there were raspberries up there. Yes, there's Ben and Jerry's ice cream. That wasn't the one I was thinking of, but that hadn't been mentioned either. There was one other thing, unless someone mentioned this. This is going to be one of those times now where they said, oh, I said that. Yes. Bread, broccoli. There were eggs up there. I think someone said eggs. Corn. Oh, I don't think I put corn on the cob on there. I'll tell you what the last one was. Tomato soup. Did anyone say tomato soup? Anyway, all of those things are things that we obviously recognize, perhaps we like. Maybe we've grown some of those things in our gardens. Maybe we've bought some of those things from the shops. And those are all things that we should be thanking God for this morning when we think about the harvest. So keep those things in their minds. Now, another question for you. Are there any farmers here? Either farmers now or have been farmers? Yes, we've got a farmer there. Another farmer there, brilliant. We should be thanking God for our farmers who have been out there working, maybe this year, maybe for many years, getting the harvest in. Are there any people here with gardens who grow vegetables? Few more hands going up. We should be thanking God for people who grow vegetables in their gardens. Are there anybody, is there anybody here who makes buildings for farmers to do stuff in, like keep chickens and that sort of thing? Yes, yeah, we've got someone who does that. So we should be thanking for anybody who helps farmers do their jobs. What about people, anyone here who makes things from food? Maybe in a factory, or maybe at home, making a meal. Anybody here make meals out of food? Oh, a few hands and a few very polite people who don't want to put up their hands. Anybody here who works in a shop that sells food? No one works in a shop. Oh, well, we should be thankful for the people who work in shops, who we then go and buy our food off. Are there any shops in Freshingfield? You must have a shop or two. What's the name of the shop? Mace. Mace. We should be thanking God for the people who work in there. Do you know what? In Rendlesham, we have cost cutter. Never really thought about cost cutter as being really important until we didn't have cost cutter. Do you know what? The people who worked in cost cutter for us during lockdown were brilliant at getting stuff that we needed and we couldn't get from the big supermarkets. They were getting flour from Poland because they couldn't get it in this country. They were getting pasta when Tesco's couldn't find it. We should be grateful for those. Anybody works here in order to buy some food? Yeah. Does anybody have a job which some of their money then goes to get food, buy food? Of course, that's what we do, isn't it? We should be thanking God for all of these things. So I'm going to pray now. That's what we should do when we get good things. As that song said, we should thank the Lord for all his love. 
because all of these good things, although other people are involved, come to us from God. So we're going to pray now. Our Father, we do want to thank you for all these wonderful things that we've been talking about. We thank you for the things that we've been thinking about, fruit and vegetables that we could grow in our gardens, wheat and barley that grows in the fields to make flour, to make bread and spaghetti. We thank you for the people who work so hard on the farms, bringing in the harvest. We know it's a difficult job. We thank you for lorry drivers and tractor drivers who sometimes annoy us a bit because they're not driving as fast as we would like to go on the roads, but they're doing the work of bringing in the harvest. We thank you for people who work in factories, turning things like wheat and barley into food that we can buy. We thank you for people who work in shops. We thank you for the mace shop in Fressenfield and the people who work there. We thank you for the bigger shops in Dis and other places where we get the things that we need. And we thank you that we can grow these things for ourselves too. We can have the fun of growing things in our gardens. We can plant seeds and they grow without us having to do anything else. Father, we thank you for the wonderful world that you have made for us. And we pray that you would help us to look after it and be grateful for it. Because so often we just forget the miracles that are going on around us all the time. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song now, which I don't think many of the grown-ups will know, because I'm told it's a song that's sung at Fressingfield School that just happens to be on your system. So this song is one which the children are going to have to sing nice and loud and to teach the grown-ups. It's called the Harvest Samba. I didn't know it until Pastor Stewart sent me a list of the songs that you sing here sometimes, and I looked at that and I listened to it on YouTube, and I thought, that's a great song. So why don't we stand now and try and sing as best as we can the Harvest Samba.
That, in case you can't see, is a pile of corn in a farm that belongs to Michael Cordell. I was talking about him on Wednesday night, the guy who helped me out with my clay pigeon shoot. And he let me go and work with him for a couple of weeks over the summer, which I love doing. That's what I used to do when I was a teenager, work on a farm. I had worked on a farm for years. And Michael said, why don't you come and just help me out? He didn't say that at all. I said, please, can I come? And he said, yes, that would be lovely. But the best thing about that was, that's not me standing on the right-hand side there in the corner. That's my son. I got to spend two weeks on a farm with my son, just like I used to spend time in my holidays on a farm with my dad. That was such a blessing to me, and I'm so grateful to God for that. Here's another one. We went up to the Lake District, and that's me standing in front of my favorite mountain, but on a side I'd never seen before, Great Gable in the Lake District. We climbed Great Gable, and we went up that way. My daughter posted that picture on Facebook, not on Facebook, on WhatsApp, our WhatsApp group, and she said, probably the happiest man in the world. And that's how I felt, standing there with Great Gable behind me, a sight that I'd never seen from that angle. So thrilled about that. That was number three. Number two? This is me and my daughters in Hyde Park at a Billy Joel concert. How brilliant is that? That was one of the best days out that I've had in a long time. And the really great thing about that was that was a Christmas present to me from my daughters. And I still get a bit emotional thinking about it. We had a chance to go out and spend the day in London and go to a Billy Joel concert. Absolutely brilliant. And this was number one on my list. This is my daughter's wedding. My daughter Alice got married at the end of July. And there's us at the wedding. Now, let's get rid of those pictures. That's just my top five. I want you to be thinking about stuff that God has done for you that has been a real blessing to you. And here's the reason. My summer wasn't all brilliant. My last couple of weeks haven't all been brilliant. There have been times over the last year when I have been crying because things have been so bad and I have been so sad. Just a week and a half ago, I was in a really, really sad situation. Something had gone wrong. Someone I loved had had a big problem. And I was thinking, Lord, why are you doing this? Why have you let that happen? Remembering these sorts of things doesn't make all the other sadnesses go away. But it does help me to remember that, no, God does still love me. No, God can use bad situations for good. God has given me great blessings. God does love me. He can do amazing things. So I've just got to trust him now to get through whatever the difficult situation is. I think that's a really important thing. And that's what we're going to be thinking about as we jump back into the letter of James, James's letter to his church in around the Mediterranean. Mediterranean the need to remember God's goodness when things aren't going quite so well. The need to be encouraging each other with the stories of how God has blessed us or reminding each other of how God has blessed them in the past when they're going through difficult times. Even when we hurt and are sad. We're going to remind ourselves now of some more things that God has done for us as we sing about the many good things God has given to us. And then we'll have another quick look at James chapter 1. We're going to sing now a great song of thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Why? Because of the 10,000 reasons and many, many more that God has given us. The many blessings he's given to us that remind us to carry on trusting him and praising him. So let's stand when the music starts and sing together.
pray again together now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words of that song and that line that says, 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. And we thank you that we can always find reasons to praise you most of the time. So, Father, we pray that you would help us to use the thankfulness we feel when you bless us with things that we would call good to keep us going through times when things are difficult. Father, on this morning of Harvest Thanksgiving, we, we have so many things to thank you for, but we are also so conscious that there are people in the fellowship here who are going through tough times, who are struggling with huge burdens. And Father, we want to pray specifically for them at this moment. Lord, particularly the family of this little girl who's facing surgery tomorrow. Father, please help them, support them, strengthen them. Father, we pray that this little girl would be healed, that the operation would do its job, that the care that she needs would be given and that she would recover. Lord, we pray that during this time, the family would know you strengthening and supporting them. We want to pray for Leah off at university now. We pray for her parents and wider family missing her. Please be with her and help her to settle down quickly. Comfort them as they miss each other. For other people who have been through hard times, bereavement, injury, accident, Lord, remind them that you are with them, that you know how they feel. Father, please strengthen them and comfort them, we pray. And be with us now as we think about your word and the good things you give to us. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we started our service this morning by thinking about James chapter 1, verse 17. We're going to read the verses that come either side of that now to find out what James is getting at when he writes, all good gifts come down from our Father in heaven. So James chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 12, and I've just realized that maybe I've got a different version to you. What version do you use here? Is that the NIV on the screen? or It is the NIV, good, I've got the NIV too, so I can read from my notes. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Did you spot it? Our verse about all good gifts coming down from God, there it was just before the end of our reading. So far, as we've thought about that verse, we've focused on good things we would call good. But James is talking, I think, about something a bit different. The surprise is, of course, James is not talking about harvest, although he does hint about harvest at the end of that reading with the talk of first fruits. But the real surprise is the things that James is thinking about when he calls them good gifts. Because when James uses that phrase, all good gifts, he's thinking about things that we would normally think of as bad. James is not talking primarily about groceries and bumper crops. He's talking about trials and difficulties, hardships and heartaches. I just want to point out very briefly in the time we've got left, three things that James wants us to notice. And the first thing under this heading of all good gifts is, trials will come. Trials are promised, even if you're a Christian. That's a silly thing to say, isn't it? Especially 
if you're a Christian, because James is writing to Christians. Maybe you're not a Christian this morning, and if you're here and you're not a Christian, I'm so glad you're here. That is brilliant. I'm glad you've come along maybe at the invitation of a friend, maybe because you're thinking, maybe there's something in this Christianity, maybe the Bible has got something for me. I hope that's you. But if you're coming along this morning and you're thinking, my life is pretty tough, maybe Jesus will make it easier for me. Well, it doesn't work like that. He won't. James starts his letter in verse 2 with the words, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. That's a promise. Not if you face trials, not on the unlikely chance that you face trials, then keep going through them. When? Because they will come. If you are a Christian or you become a Christian and something goes wrong and you suffer, don't be surprised. And that's good news. Because we know life can be tough, don't we? We know life is hard for everybody. This is one of my experiences as I've been involved in ministry for the last 18 years or however long it's been. I don't have to talk to people for very long before I find that they are living with heartaches and hardships. The Bible doesn't brush that under the carpet. The Bible doesn't say those things aren't real. James says these things are real. They will come. It was true for James's readers in the first century. Some of them were out of work because they were Christians. The employers didn't want these weird Christians working for them, so they kicked them out. Some of their old religious friends had turned their backs on them when they became Christians. Some people who had been Jews, who were Jews, wouldn't have anything to do with these people who had been Jews and were now Christians. No one took any notice of them. When they said, we think it would be a good idea if people just closed their ears because these were Christians who were talking. You don't listen to Christians, not in those days. Some of them were poor because they were Christians. And on top of all that sort of stuff, they they got, because of their trust in Jesus, there was the usual hassles of life as well. When they got sick, they still hurt. They were still weak. They still suffered relationship breakdowns. And James says, this is normal. This is what you should expect. And anyone who tells you otherwise is a liar. James doesn't say that, but that's what he means. Some people say, don't they? Come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved. Come to Jesus and you'll never suffer again. That's rubbish. Coming to Jesus means to follow Jesus. And Jesus suffered hugely. If we follow him, we will suffer too. And James's big message in our verses this morning is, when we suffer, when we suffer these trials that will come, we have a choice. We can either trust God or give in to temptation. And James's big message is this, trusting God will get us to heaven. But if we give in to temptation, well, that's the path to hell. And I want us to briefly follow James's thinking and then spend a few moments applying that to our lives. So first point is trials will come. Second point, we can trust God. That is the best option for us. Trust God when he says he has a purpose in our trials. Trust God when he says he will bring good out of our suffering. Did you know that? Trials can do you good. We know that, don't we? That's one of the things we learn as we grow up. Difficult things, painful things, unpleasant things can sometimes be good for us. Simple examples, medicine tastes horrible. I remember having to take penicillin medicine as a child. It was gross. But I was persuaded to take it because it would cure the infection that I had. Medicine does us good. Operations are painful. I had an operation on my shoulder 18 months ago. Everyone I went to see at the hospital said, you want to go through with this? Are you sure you want to go through this? This this is a really painful operation. And I kept saying, yeah, my shoulders really caused me problems. They were right. My shoulder was horrible for about nine months. But now I'm through that. The pain of the operation was worth it. A few weeks ago, I was in the gym. One of my neighbours didn't recognise me. Such was my appearance. 
I was covered in sweat. I was hardly able to stand up as I got off the cross, uh, the cross trainer. I was in agony. I looked really ill. Why do I choose to go to the gym? <laughs> you can tell I don't go very often. But just think what I would have been like, would look like if I didn't go at all. Because I think sometimes that the gym does me good. It would give me the body I dream of long term, very long term. Uh, forget that, that's not going to work, is it? But I know it, perhaps it will help me be healthy in the future. It helps me relax. Trials can be good. Of course, trials don't always do us good. Sometimes bad things happen and there is no hope. Ultimately, we will all die. And for many people, that is the worst thing possible. But for the Christian, the promise of the Bible, the promise of God, is that he has a good purpose in mind whenever he allows us to go through things. Now, please don't think God is there thinking, well, what can I create for them next? God is not the source of evil. God doesn't make bad things happen, but he does allow them. He could stop them. But sometimes God allows bad things to happen. And his purpose, if we're Christians, is to strengthen us, to bless us, to make us better, ultimately to make us more like Jesus. Sometimes trials help in everyday life. Always trials will make the Christian stronger. Trials are good. That's why James says at the beginning, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. But here's the thing. Trials don't have to make us stronger. You see, God's purpose in allowing us trials is to make us stronger, but we have a choice. If we trust God, the trial will make us stronger, but we can also give in to temptation. That's the third thing. James says, when tempted, when tested, no one should say, God is tempting me. But God cannot be tempted by evil. Notice again the word when. We will be tempted. Temptations will come when we go through trials. But James says, and this is a really strong, underlined in bold now in the way it's written in the Greek, no one should say. When you're faced with a trial and you're looking for a way out and something that is evil pops into your mind, no one should say, this is your fault, God. That is not from God when someone gives into temptation. The trouble is we're so quick to try and blame God for evil, aren't we? When bad things happen to us, we so readily turn around to God and say, this is all your fault, God. You've made this happen. You made me do it. You could have stopped me. It's your fault, God. Or we try and make out that the sinful thing that we're tempted to do is actually okay. God put me in this situation, so it must be God's will for me to do this. Or, and this is a really common one, I've heard this so many times over my life, really. God wants me to be happy. And this is the only way I can be happy, so it must be all right to give in to temptation in this way. That is a lie. God wants me to be happy. That's not what God's plan is for us, to be happy. God's plan for us is to be holy, which is, of course, linked with our eternal happiness. So when I say God's plan is not for us to be happy, it's not to be happy right here, right now. God's plan is for us to be perfectly happy forever. And we will only get that by being holy. It's never the right thing to sin in order to deal with a difficult situation. So where does temptation come from if it doesn't come from God? James tells us each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Do you know what the word is there? It's fishing language. It's a lure. Just imagine you're out fishing and you've put a worm onto your hook and you've thrown it over the side of your boat. And there's the worm wriggling around in the water and a fish comes along. And the fish looks at the worm. Fishes like to eat worms. And so the fish swims in a bit closer, starts imagining how tasty that worm is going to be. The fish is cautious, of course. Fishes are notoriously nervous, but the worm looks so good wriggling there in the water. 
And the fish is hungry, it opens its mouth, it starts salivating. I don't even know if fish can salivate, surely it's just washed away. Anyway, it's there, it's imagining tasting that worm. It opens its mouth, it takes the worm, and it tastes so good. But what's this? Is this a bit of gristle in the worm? Is it a bit of bone? And then the hook grabs into the side of the fish's mouth. And it's dragged out of the water and into the cooking pot. That's how temptation works, isn't it? It looks so attractive. But James says it leads to death. It's an easy path. You just go with the flow. You do what you feel is right. You avoid everything that's difficult. You act selfishly in every situation. You don't listen to anyone else, even God. You make your choices based on what will make your day or your life easier, happier. But James says that's a terrible thing to do when you're facing trials. It's one of the clearest links in the Bible that the Bible makes. Sin and death, they go together. Where sin is the attitude that says, shove off God, I'm in charge, not you. Sin is the worst sort of poison. It tastes sweet initially, and you've swallowed a lethal dose before you know you're in trouble. James bellows out at this point. Don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. How would you feel if your closest friend was walking along a cliff, blindfolded? You'd want to warn them, wouldn't you? Or if they're about to touch the live rail on a railway line. That's how James is feeling. He loves his church. Now scattered through the Roman Empire, be careful, he says, don't be deceived. Now, I realise that I might be talking to people who aren't as yet Christians this morning. This is so for you. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you are in such danger. The most serious of sins is to ignore God, to not submit to God, to not love God, to not live your life for God. And if you're not a Christian, you're guilty of that. There is only one hope for you, to trust God, to come to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness through Jesus and his death in your place, to place your life in his scarred but loving hands and start following him, obeying him. And once you've done that, your life becomes a life of trying to say no to temptation where trials come, trying to trust God. If you're not a Christian, that's what you need to do. If you become a Christian, if you think you are a Christian this morning, you can know for certain you're a Christian by asking this simple question, when faced with trials, are you doing all you can to trust God in your trials or are you giving in to temptation to try and avoid them? The Christian will be trying to trust God and fight temptation. Now, please hear me right on this. I'm not saying that we are going to get this right all the time. I would love to be able to tell you that I trust God in every situation. I'm never tempted to despair or to do something that's wrong. I do that regularly. But when I'm thinking straight, when I'm conscious of what I've been saved from and what God has done for me, I am so wishing that I could trust God more and I could fight temptation more. And I'm so sad of the times when I do take things into my own hands. A Christian is not somebody who trusts, come what may. A Christian is someone who wants to. And a Christian is not someone who never gives in to temptation. A Christian is someone who wants to resist temptation more. Let's make this really practical as we finish. A few examples of what this could look like in our situation. I don't know if any of you take exams now. I'm hoping you're past that. I'm certainly past that. But if you are taking exams, you know that the exam is going to be tough. It's going to be a test. The temptation might be to cheat. The temptation might be to not bother. The temptation might be to pretend to be ill so you miss it. None of those things are good. To trust God might be to work hard to get ready for that exam, to do your best and to pray that God's will will be done in your life when you take that test. 
because it's possible it might be God's will for you to fail if he doesn't want you to get that qualification and go on that particular journey through your life. Or he might want you to pass. The most important thing is that God's will is done. What about a job then? Maybe you're unemployed and you've spotted the dream job. It's in the right location, it's the right job, you apply and you get an interview. But the trial comes when you get rejected for that job. Temptation says, blame God. He could have given you that job. Temptation says, get grumpy. Temptation says, stop going to church because God's not looking after you, so why should you be bothered in him? To trust God means to accept that maybe this was God's will for you not to have that job, and if it is, he's got something better for you. And pray that you might believe that. <laughs> That's a personal one. I really wanted to work for British Nuclear Fuels when I left university. I applied for the job. I got a second interview. I went and I spent three days up there. Right job, right location. It was in the Lake District. There was even a good church to go to. And then I got the rejection letter. I was devastated. But looking back, had I got that job, I would never have met my wife. I wouldn't have my four children. I wouldn't have so many blessings. Looking back, I am so glad that God said no to working in Cumbria. What about this one? This is a big one for me. Mechanical breakdown. I'm a bit OCD when it comes to cars. I like a car that's working well. I was driving down the A12 about this time last year. Cam belt went on my daughter's car as I was taking it back to her, having just fixed it for her. I was crying on the side of the A12 while I waited for Britannia Rescue to come and pick me up. What are we going to do? I can't afford to replace the car because a cam belt going absolutely dead. I was in a really bad way. And then I remembered I'd been teaching a group at church something about this. And so with tears still on my cheeks, I prayed, Lord, please help me to trust you in this. Please help me to remember your goodness to me in times gone by. Please help me to remember your faithfulness and help me not to worry. I would love to say I didn't worry again. And it was a difficult few weeks, but God did help me. It was a massive help to be able to give myself that sort of talking to. I can tell you the end of that story afterwards. We don't have time at the moment. What about poverty? Maybe... We don't have what we would like, and the temptation is to moan about our employer or other people's meanness about God not providing for us. Maybe the temptation is to, when we're out shopping, to slip a few things into our basket without scanning them, if that's what we do. Trust says, remember God's goodness so far, you've got here. Pray, give us this day our daily bread. It's not wrong to pray for food. Pray for wisdom to know how perhaps to manage your finances better. Pray for contentment to do without the things you think you need. Pray that God's will would be done. And then try and trust him for it. What about someone who is difficult to get on with? The temptation is to ignore them, to moan, grumble, complain about them to other people. Maybe to gossip to other people about them. That's not good. To trust God is to pray something like, Lord, help me to be calm with them. Help me to grow in love and patience for them. Help that person, Lord. And help me, perhaps, to spot if I'm the cause of their unpleasant behaviour. It's a good thing to pray and show love, patience and unselfish kindness. We're doing some stuff on the fruit of the Spirit back in Rendlesham at the moment. Love, joy, peace. We pray, Lord, make me loving. And the Lord often puts awkward people in our path, people who are difficult to love, to help us grow in love. We need to trust God, trust the Holy Spirit. Someone who's difficult to live with, temptation is to argue, to stay silent, maybe to leave or hook up with someone else. To trust God is to show love, to pray for help in keeping marriage vows, to love like Jesus, even when the person is not loving back, to work at loving. Illness. Maybe long-term, that's stopping you doing what you want to do, giving you pain. The temptation 
is to moan and grumble and complain to God, about God, to other people. Why is God putting me through this stuff? Moan about others, including those who are trying to help you. Avoid doing things that we ought to be doing. All those sorts of things can come with illness. To trust God means, Lord, please help me cope with this. Pray for healing by all means. Ha ask other people to pray for healing too. But pray too that God would help us accept his will for our lives. Keep going as best we can. Looking to the Lord to help us. A few years ago, I was crippled with back pain. Such a blessing to receive the love and support of Christians around me. Looking back, I wouldn't have missed that for the world. I've got a good friend who is crippled with illness, can barely walk now. She's not very old. And yet she's the loveliest, most content person I know. She's trusting. My time is gone. James's big point, whatever happens to us is God's plan for us. He's not responsible for bad things, but he does allow them. And his purpose is to make us stronger, to make us more like Jesus, to make us happier than we could ever imagine for the whole of eternity. In that sense, these things are all good things. And we need to trust God who is forever faithful. Because as the Bible and our last song tells us, his love endures forever. So let's use these thoughts to thank God and praise him for his goodness. Let's sing together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever.
Father, we thank you for your many goodnesses to us. We thank you for the harvest. We thank you for your provision for us in many ways. But Lord, we know that life is not always like that. And we pray that you would help us to keep on trusting you, even when dark skies come and life is hard. Help us to trust you, the God who forever is faithful, forever loves us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Some tricky stuff, difficult stuff we've been talking about. If you want to come and argue with me, please feel free. If you want to ask questions about other situations you're going through and you want to talk to someone who doesn't know the church here particularly well, very happy to chat to you about that. And if you're struggling with the leaflet that I've given you, um, some of the younger ones, maybe you're trying to find some stuff in there and you can't find, then I'll try and answer those questions as well. Thank you very much.